Hey everybody! Recently I did a video on the upcoming game Anno 1800. I broke down all of the features of the beta and I largely had overwhelming praise for it. And for people that know me, that's a bit of a rare occurrence. Now that was my first experience with the Anno series. I mentioned in that video that whenever I wanted to play an Anno game previously, there was always one game people told me you have to play first. And that was Anno 1404 and after how much I enjoyed 1800's beta, I picked up 1404 and gave it a go. The game is fantastic. Spoiler alert, the game that everybody pretty much universally recommends is great. But I thought in this video I'd do a little bit of a breakdown of the gameplay and explore some of the comparisons between the upcoming 1800 and the old 1404. So it's worth mentioning that though Anno 1404 is a 10 year old game, it still holds up extremely well and it's extremely cheap. I picked it up for 75% off during a sale for about $3. I played it on Windows 10 with a pretty modern GPU and CPU and I had no issues whatsoever. The game runs great and it looks great, but my only pet peeve I guess would be that there's no borderless windowed mode in the settings, but you can very easily just edit a file to get it that way if you prefer. So let's get into the gameplay. Now for my time with Anno 1404, I largely just played the sandbox mode. That's kind of how I like to play these games primarily, and there's tons of settings to customize the type of game you want, including changing the victory conditions, who you play against, the frequency of disasters, and all sorts of different start conditions as well. Now if you get a bit bored of the sandbox, there is a meaty campaign and six tailored scenarios with specific start and win conditions, so there's quite a lot there for people to explore with a range of difficulties as well. So in 1404, everything takes place on one map. The map is filled with islands of varying size and resources, and there's a few predetermined islands that house the AI quest givers. On default settings, all players start on a ship at Kingsport, which is controlled by Lord Richard Northburg, and you all embark and set sail to find and colonize your first island. Though this is really random as you're just exploring the open seas, it is still quite fun to see where the others go and try to get close to them or maybe far away if you're a little bit intimidated. And it gives you really the feel of exploration at the beginning, which really fits the time period. Now the map is always divided between the northern biome, which is kind of more lush and fertile, and then a southern biome, which is more desert-like, and each come with their own types of resources that we'll touch on in just a bit. So when building on your first island, this is where we start to see the major differences between 1800 and 1404. Now of course, 1404 came first, about 10 years ago, and 1800 builds on top of the last two games as well, 2070 and 2205. So there's obviously a blend of new and old ideas in 1800, which is why it's an interesting thing to form a comparison to. Now the first major difference I notice is that buildings don't require workers. All production buildings just work on their own. You could have no population whatsoever, and your farms, mines, lumber mills, bakeries, or whatever you have will all just work and produce goods no problem. Now you typically would never do this, you do need population in houses to make money from taxes, and you also need them to advance to the next level of goods, so from peasant to citizen to patrician and to nobleman. This gives you the access to more complex and better goods, which sell for more money and are also needed to sustain the people. But the root of the concept of not needing people is still there, and it's definitely encouraged in some instances. If you have a good enough sized population on your home island, you may very well just want to go to another island and set up production buildings and import everything back home. This means you have entire islands with their own economies, but nobody living there, just people working there. After playing Anno 1800, where jobs and population was one to one, and you even needed different classes of workers to get different jobs, this felt really simplified, so I thought it was an interesting concept to bring up. In an age where PC gamers often feel like their games are getting maybe a little less complex to appeal to wider audiences, here's an example of where it's clearly gotten a little bit deeper in regards to population management. Now because of the population situation, you also don't need to link all buildings with roads. Instead, you have pockets of roads and isolated communities that work together just fine. Because the marketplaces and market buildings are all linked like magic chests, what goes in one comes out the other instantly, which is the same for all Anno games, but it's just a little easier to set up here because you don't need roads to link them all together. So you don't have to cover as much of the island in order to build what you need. If you set up on the coast of an island, for example, and then on the opposite coast is a resource you want right now, just build on it and you'll get it. You don't need to connect it back to your port. It's just that simple. But I'm not knocking Anno 1404. It does add complexity in other ways, which we'll get to in just a bit. Now in terms of goods production, 1404 and 1800 are very similar. You have four classes of population that each require increasingly complex items before they will promote to the next class. For example, once a peasant house has all of its requirements met, such as fish, cider, being close to a market and a church, 
then they promote up to a citizen, and require things that need refinement in buildings and exotic resources like spices. This is where some of the added complexity starts to come in then for 1404. Now before you venture south, you need to visit the Grand Vizier's island and offer him a gift. This will earn you prestige with him, and he'll allow you to start settling on the southern islands, and creating housing, giving you access to the nomad population down there, as well as the envoys population class eventually. This then allows you to acquire spices, which allows you to ship it back home and fulfill the needs of your population to grow them and expand the class. There's a lot of steps to that, not to mention the gift itself that you give to the Grand Vizier. It's purchased from Lord Richard with honor. Now, honor points are earned by completing quests, and quests come from Lord Richard or the Grand Vizier himself or the head of the Corsairs, and sometimes from your population. Sometimes a guild will ask you to locate a certain person, maybe move them, maybe rescue some people, or sometimes you just need to fulfill a certain amount of goods, you could explore an island, escort ships, even defeating other Corsairs and things like that. These quests are all timed, and the game does not pause, so you're always kept busy keeping everything in order with your own stuff, as well as micromanaging your ships and quests to earn you the honor required to allow you to build up relations with the Grand Vizier. A lot of steps to that. Now, the more gifts and prestige that you build, the more complex items you can cultivate and produce in the Southern Islands. So unlike the North, which has a much more linear progression that you can pretty much be in control of yourself, the South progresses through quests and actions that you perform. It's a really nice balance between the two styles of gameplay. If you don't do your quests and keep the South kind of happy and keep unlocking new stuff, then your North will start to fall behind. It's really, really clever. It gets even more complex because honor can then also be spent on better items and upgrades for your ships and buildings, so you always have to then decide between faster expansion or stronger production, which is an excellent trade-off. You also eventually purchase items that allow you to embark on expeditions off the map, where your navies return with various goods. But in 1404, this is an automatic process. It's really great that in later games like 1800, you get to physically go to a different map, as well as have the interactive dilemmas about the expeditions, but it's still a pretty decent mechanic here. Another interesting aspect to the Southern Islands is that you need to build norias, which hydrate the land and create fertile soil but they then need to be replenished regularly or they will run out of water and dry up again. This can be expensive to do, so you need to make sure that you can sustain yourself down there, else your spice trade may dry up and your citizens back home may start revolting. It's quite an interesting dependency chain that isn't always easy to track, because you don't necessarily know when you're about to run out. You might also run out of coal or stone and need to pay to replenish them, and it can cost a serious amount of gold to do that. I was often forced to load up my ships manually with some of my best goods and just sell them off to the nearest buyer to get a bulk of cash to quickly replenish things to stop everything from breaking down. Now, all while you're doing your quests and expanding your lands, so is the AI. In 1404, you can actually both colonize the same island, and whoever puts up their market buildings first gets control of that area. In that way, they're almost like outposts, so it's often good to just build four or five of them in a row to get full coverage of an island and make sure no one else settles there. If an island is contested, you could end up going to war for full control, and that can be nasty business. It's probably one of the features that will be most sorely missed, and that is land combat. Anno 1800 only has naval combat, where destroying a harbor will net you the entire island instantly, but in 1404, you can fight and claim parts of an island and expand in a much more organic way. The army system in 1404 is actually quite in-depth and very clever for a game that's focused on production chains and economy. The combat itself isn't something you're going to have too much control of. You tell a unit to go attack something, and they do. And if your strength outweighs their strength, eventually you'll grind them down and win. What is cool is that it's all about forward placement and the placement of defenses. In order to start, you need to build a keep. Then you have three types of military unit, small, big, and artillery camps. These camps cost different things to make. The military camps require patricians to make weapons, and artillery requires noblemen to produce war machines. These are created from a lot of refined goods and a lot of gold, so a big investment goes into it. Now when you create all of this stuff, you must place the camp somewhere. The camps take up space, and they can be ordered to pack up and move anywhere. However, if they want to attack, they can only attack within a certain range from their camp's position. So what this leads to is traveling to another city, positioning camps as far forward as you can, and then launching attacks on defenses. But fighting in cities is tricky, as it's so built up that you can't place your camps around, there's not enough space. So you need to destroy a few buildings with the artillery and then push in. 
If you make it to the market, then you have that sector and you can push further. All the while, walls, towers and others try to keep you out. The defenses create zones of control that you cannot put your forward placements in. So you have to like slowly launch your attacks and grind them down. It's really a lot of fun and as you take more and more damage, you work up a logistical problem. The health of units will start dwindling. Now to restore this, you need to make provisions. Provisions need to be created in provision houses. Then you can decide what provisions you make, small, medium, or large bulks of them. And they have different requirements. So the more complex the goods, usually like wine, fur coats, and beef, the more provisions you get in bulk. That then needs to be transported, loaded up onto ships, and brought to the front line to your troops, and they'll begin healing over time. Again, Factoring in the economic gameplay to create military provisions and units is such an excellent facet to the game, I'm really going to miss it in 1800 now that I've played it. If you want to take a city, you have to be careful not to damage it too much and just take the key areas, unless you are a true warmonger and want to just destroy everything, which of course is much more costly and slow. I didn't play 1404 in multiplayer, but I could imagine that experienced players would target fleets and navies that were carrying provisions, trying to render the men helpless on the islands and letting them die off that way. And a few times I had close encounters with the AI in that regard, although, you know, it's my sp I'm pretty skilled on that normal difficulty, so it didn't quite happen. Anyway, naval combat itself works as expected. It's a simple affair, though buffs and debuffs can sway a battle if you have special equipment. With so many islands and a bigger focus on production islands, cutting supply is just as deadly as an invasion, so a strong navy is always paramount. The last thing I want to mention will be the random encounters and characters on the map. I really like that these are they're in 1800 to an extent, but I don't think they are on land. Essentially, when you connect a road to a unique area in 1404, you can talk to the person there and help them do whatever it is they're doing. By giving them bundles of goods, they'll then give you a reward. And I don't know, it's just another nice little side objective to keep track of that I enjoyed a lot. You find an island with something special on it, it's like, oh, I'm going to connect up to that and see what's going on there. So yeah, that's it for my Anno 1404 video. Like I said at the top, I highly recommend the game. It still looks fantastic and it plays very well. We can definitely see how some of the aspects of the series have progressed. The multiple sessions that run simultaneously, the job to worker production chains, the ease of multiplayer, and a much more refined user experience with the UI and trade routes. But 1404 definitely has some special gameplay to it, such as the combat experience, the fact that you can take in or turn away beggars, which could start a like, mini war, the focus on quests to appease foreign rulers and promote pops abroad, and also some little details like running a tournament and just watching the little jousting match take place. <laughs> If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving me a like. Maybe share it with a friend if you think they'd be interested. And if you haven't seen it, check out my Anno 1800 video. I'm still pretty excited for that game. And now that I have this understanding of one of the best in the series, I should be able to give a much more authoritative review of it when it comes out in April. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.